Good morning and happy Sabbath. I want to welcome all of you who are joining us online. And Frank, do we have an official number of how many people are actually streaming with us today? We have 29 streaming with us at the moment. So we want to welcome you to Stone Tower. And uh, we just had a little bit of a sprinkling of snow outside, but we are here to conduct worship with you online. And for those of you who braved the weather and came here to join us here physically, we just want to remind you that some of the best practices to main some what they call social distancing. I'm sure you probably heard that word quite a bit now. So that's maintaining at least a three to six foot barrier between, of space between you and the next person. Now obviously family members, you can sit as close as you want with them, you know, because if one of them gets it, you're probably gonna get it too. But um, I just wanted to go over some cancellation notices here. Uh, we had scheduled a men's breakfast in the morning tomorrow, and there was also a Northwest Veg at the evening, all of those have been canceled. Uh, the Impact Health for Portland also has been postponed. And prayer meeting for next week, I believe that's March 18th, uh, that has also been canceled. We are going to have a church board meeting on Tuesday. And that is not canceled. And neither is the finance committee meeting for that day. And at this board meeting, we will be talking about future events and whether or not we will be canceling them. And we'll let you uh, know via email and maybe even through texting and on our website and Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. So just to let you know. All right. So looks like most of you stayed home. And that's a good decision. That helps us to flatten the curve, as they say. And we want to just to remind you that please continue to wash your hands on a regular basis. Uh, don't try to touch your face. Uh, make sure that you practice social distancing and so forth. So we're not going to have a children's story today. And so in a moment, we'll just go ahead and start our worship service. So we want to thank you once again for joining us on Stone Tower's live stream. Hope you enjoy our worship service today. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Wherever you're tuning in from wherever in the world, we're glad that you're here with us and we'd like to begin our worship service this morning by inviting you to kneel wherever you are, your family room, your, uh, your bedroom, wherever you are turning in, tuning in, we'd like to invite you to kneel and invite those who are here to kneel and join us in seeking the Lord to be with us. Gracious Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the privilege that is ours to worship you, King of kings and Lord of lords. We thank you that we have the promise of scripture that where two or three are gathered there in your name, there you are in their midst. We thank you for being here present in this sanctuary. We thank you for being present with each person in their homes. And I pray now as we worship together that you would fill each one of us with your Holy Spirit and turn our thoughts towards Jesus. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Him to Yahweh, let his praise resound from the ends of the earth. Let the sea and all that it holds sing his praises, the islands and those who inhabit them. Let the desert and its cities raise their voice. Let the inhabitants shout from the mountaintops. Let them give glory to Yahweh. We 
are going to invite those in our audience this morning to join us in singing, but we're also going to invite those of you who are watching at home to join us in singing also. The words will appear on your screen so that you can sing along with us. So the first song we're going to do this morning is number 361, Hark Tis the Shepherd's Voice I Hear. You notice it says mission of the church. And what is the mission of our church? Is to seek the lost and save them and bring them to Jesus. That is our mission. And this is what we're doing. Hark tis of shepherd's voice I hear. Let us sing together. to bring them in, we must believe in our message. We must believe that Christ is our Savior, and we must know in whom we believe in. So let us, we're going to sing, I know whom I have believed, number 511. And if you truly believe this, let us sing together, number 511.
Our, call, our opening hymn is number 256. And I'm going to invite those who are here this morning to stand as we sing number 256, Ye Servants of God. And those at home, please join us. had tried to stone me to death and now my cousins were here to finish the job. Find out how God is using Adventist World Radio to reach the Muslim community and other difficult to reach areas with the gospel message. Hi, I'm Cam Utman and this is AWR 360. Adventist World Broadcasting to the most remote locations of the world and more than 130 different languages. We've been doing this for the past, well, almost 50 years now, but I've never seen anything like this before. From baptizing rebels and assassins, almost daily we receive news of amazing miracles taking place all around this old ball of mud. Weeds and story right here in Nazareth is an example that is special. Being born Muslim, Weeson was taught to hate Christianity. So when his sister decided to become a Christian, he was sent by his family to kill her. But because of a miraculous dream from God, he decided to begin studying the Bible. He soon returned to Nazareth to share his new belief with his family. And his uncle, upon hearing this, became very angry and ordered his stoning. This happened over and over until finally his brother stepped in. Then his father advised Wiesem to flee the country. Years later, after his father and uncle died, Wiesem's mother invited him to return. He immediately saw an opportunity to share Jesus in Nazareth. So he decided to set up a center of influence where he used the Bible to teach English to his fellow people. We also gave we some AWR God Pods, which he distributed among his community. Recently though, things took a turn for the worse, as the sons of his dead uncle found out what Weeson was doing. They too had participated in his stoning many years before, and now rallied a mob and went to Weeson's house to attack him.
Weesom's wife, Audrey, heard the commotion downstairs and rushed out to see what was happening. She knew right away that Weesom was in serious trouble on her knees and began to pray. Weesom's brothers rushed to protect him when he was hit with a metal rod, but then his own cousin pulled out his knife and stabbed Weesom. But to his astonishment, the knife bent, leaving unharmed. Weesom's brother then picked up the bent knife. Try again to kill the man of God. They threatened, you will not know where or when, but we will kill you. Several months later, Weesom received a shocking phone call that these same two cousins have been killed while riding their motorcycle. It just reminds me that if God is for us, who can be against us? This miraculous event agitated the Muslim community so much that Weesom knew it was the perfect time to use AWR's cell phone evangelism. He immediately sought out someone to translate the sermons into Arabic. He found a man named Jamil who readily agreed to help. Jamil worked for days, sometimes late into the night, translating the Bible-based sermons. As he read, he was so greatly moved by the sermons that he felt compelled to share them with one of his friends from the Baptist Church. She was so amazed by the sermons that she shared them with her pastor, who was also impressed by what he read. He then sought out Weesom to preach at his church. We sim presented at the Baptist Church, sharing Bible prophecy, our health message, and Ellen White's writing to be baptized into the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And on a beautiful Sabbath day, we held a church service at the Jordan River. Then one by one, they entered into the water. We sim had the joy of baptizing these precious souls with Elder Dwayne McKee. God is calling all who are willing to proclaim his last day message. Adventist World Radio not only broadcasts into the Muslim countries in their own languages, but we are working with people like Weesom, helping to share the gospel message in countries that still need to hear the wonderful story of Jesus. Thank you for supporting AWR. Jesus is coming soon, and he invites you and me to be a part of this great movement that will light the earth with the knowledge of his truth. From broadcast to baptism, this is AWR 360. Well, this is an amazing story for our uh, offering appeal today. And actually, uh, uh, Elder Dwayne McKay had the privilege to come to our congregation, right? You remember. And then also, uh, beginning of this year, actually, I was able to, with my family, to uh, held that, uh, hold that uh, bent knife, and I took some picture. Not only that, the, that person's original shirts uh, he gave it to Dwayne McKee so he can present this to everywhere uh, he goes. And there was two holes in the back of the shirts, and it exactly fit that. And so this is a God's protection and God's miracle that this uh, steel that is so hard uh, that it can just bend like that without going through. And so uh, this is what I, uh, what I remember that, uh, uh, that God is working. And uh, I think it's time for us to uh, give our offerings to God. Uh, today, we have uh, many people who are online to watch. And uh, as you know, uh, if you click the stonetowersd.org, stonetowersd.org, and if you open that, there is a click button, and you can click the online giving then you can actually uh, 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 give offering to, to the church for the mission work. And actually, yesterday, uh, I went to the store, one of the local store, to buy some rice because we live on rice as, a, as Asian people. And there's no rice at all. And uh, uh, all the, that section is completely empty. Uh, other, other 
you know, beans and corns and everything there. And uh, actually, I, I had to go to the bathroom first, and when I come, come to that section, there was a one uh, rice bag was left, and there was somebody ahead of me already took it. And uh, uh, somehow God gave me peace. Maybe that person needs that more than I do. <laughs> but what I, what I learned from uh, that experience is I had the money, but I couldn't, I couldn't get the rice because there's no rice. There's no rice. So in that particular moment, I realized whatever money I have is useless. I think it's time coming when we even given gold or everything to the church, it's useless because there will be time like that as we are all instructed. And so I think uh, as we go through this uh, uh, global crisis, uh, it's time for us to really uh, align myself, what God wants me to do in my life. And that's, I think, what we have to answer everybody. And today, those who came to the church, as we dismiss our uh, worship service, then we'll collect uh, your offerings today. So let's have a power our head. Our Father in heaven, uh, as uh, your coming is coming sooner, and we realize that time is so short, and everything that will happen will be in a rapid way. We never realize that uh, because of uh, the current crisis, even the church uh, cannot have a regular function. But we are grateful that you already established the uh, Adventist World Radio Program globally. And through that program, we witnessed your uh, miraculous acts that you protect your people. So help us today that we understand true love cast away the fear. So help us to have a, a abundant assurance of your leading our life as we uh, not only devote our life but also devote whatever you, given, you have given to us for the expansion of your cause. Please bless us and use those funds for your glory and honor so that more people will be found in your kingdom because I ask all these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. choristers to join us at this moment as we have our song of invocation that you can find in your Bible in 2 Chronicles chapter 7 verse 14. Join me in reverently kneeling as we beseech our Lord and Maker. Our loving Heavenly Father, we are thankful for a day that we can come apart and worship you. To recognize that there, this is your sacred day of rest. That you have sanctified and hallowed for man's blessing and benefit. We thank you for your angels to draw near to us, to show us that in Christ is our righteousness, our hope, and our joy. That in the midst of trial and tribulation, you said, 
Be of good cheer, for you have overcome the world. You've given us hope, promises, the power of your Holy Spirit to dwell in our hearts and lives, your grace, unmerited favor of your love toward us, though we don't deserve it. And this, at this moment, we want to say thank you for such a friend we have in Jesus. Such an honor and a privilege to beseech you and to lay our burdens at your feet, our cares, our wants, our needs, to know that we can never burden you and we can never weary you, that your desire toward us is always one of love and compassion. And it is a privilege and a joy to your heart for you to hear the cry of, of your children. Father, at this moment we recognize that we have not always put our trust in you as we ought to have. We have not always been faithful to your promises and trusted that what you desire to do, we have not let you fulfill those. And I pray, Lord, that you would have mercy upon us as a people and as a church. For our unbelief and our doubt that has crucified your Son. And Lord, we want to confess our unbelief today that you may renew us in your grace and transform our hearts that this church may be a light in the midst of darkness, that your word may give us hope and light, that you may heal and restore our sin-sick souls. Lord, we have families, we have relationships, marriages, children that are in desperate need of your saving grace to transform our lives, to save relationships, to restore communications once again with you and with one another. Lord, we give you permission to do this work. We plead that you would do this because of our great need. I pray for those that are suffering with sickness in one way or another, physically, mentally, or spiritually. And in a special way, we want to lift up to you Jeffrey Carl, Darla Erickson, David Hagen, Marshall House, Roger Hauser, Mario Husson, Betty McClure, Carol Stone, and many others that may be unspoken upon our hearts at this moment. That you would bring your healing hand and your restorative powers that we may rest in Christ and upon your promises. That we may make decisions and choices to come in harmony with your laws of health that true heartfelt repentance may be granted to the hearts of your people, that we may live the principles you've given us, that we may have health and have it more abundantly. I pray, Lord, that at this moment, as we hear your voice, that our hearts may be softened and subdued by your Holy Spirit, that you would prepare us, Lord, for the work that you've entrusted to us in such a time as this. The world is in chaos but there is peace found in Christ. Your word has the answers. Prophecy has foretold that events like this would come. This should not be a surprise for those that know you and understand your word. But Lord, like the virgins, we've all been sleeping. And this event, we, many of us have not been prepared for. And we don't know what shall come, but we understand we need a greater faith and a real experience with you that we don't now possess to prepare us for this moment and for that of the future. So please send your Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts that this today we may be found in Christ and that your word may be the counselor and guide as we surrender our lives to you fully. Bless us with the living word from on high that we may be blessed and understand the work that you've entrusted to us for such a time as this. These things we thank you and ask you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is from Daniel 5. This uh, scene takes place in Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar's son, Belshazzar, is king. 
and he's been having a party with his friends and a hand appears on a wall and writes something and he needs help. He can't interpret it. Daniel is known throughout the land as a man of God, of the living God, an interpreter of dreams and visions. And after a while, he is called. And in verse 25 through 28, we pick up the scene. Daniel 5, verse 25. And this is the inscription that was written. Many, many, tekel, euphersen. This is the inscription, the interpretation of each word, many. God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Of Farsin, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and Persians. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Praise the Lord for the talents he has given, and may each one of us use our talents for his glory. 
and His honor. As we open God's Word together, I invite you to kneel with me once more, and we're going to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us as we open His Word together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You once again and come before Your holy throne as we open Your Word. You have said that Your Word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And we know, Lord, we're living in troublesome dark times. We need this light. We need this lamp. And so, Lord, I pray that you would guide us as we read the story of Belshazzar uh, this morning. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to see our own life and the decisions that you are calling us to, to make as we read through this story. Bless us with the gift of your Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. How many of you at home or here have a smartphone? You have a smartphone? Well, some people call it a dumb phone, but uh, a smartphone. Now, on the front of most smartphones, what do you have? A camera. And in today's day and age, you can't buy a smartphone without a camera because everybody wants to take a a selfie. But while you're taking a selfie, while you're talking on FaceTime, while you're interacting with your smartphone, thinking that nobody is watching, there could be somebody watching. It has come to light That, uh, that there are hackers around the world and the government and others who are watching. Always watching. Just curious, how many of you at home or here put a little piece of tape or paper over your camera? <laughs> yeah, because you know that somebody's watching. In fact, this is not just the fanatic conspiracy theorists that put pieces of tape and paper over their phone. Former director of the FBI, James Comey, covers all of his cameras. Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook, he covers all of his cameras. Even Pope Francis covers his cameras. But you know, with all the people that are watching through the cameras nowadays, there's one who we need to be especially aware that is watching. And he's always watching. You can throw your phone in the ocean. You can pull the power on your TV. You can run up into the mountains, but no matter where you go, God is watching. The angels of heaven are watching. They're watching what we are doing. Luke chapter 8 verse 17 says, For nothing is secret that will not be revealed, nor anything hidden that will not be known or come to light. Ecclesiastes 12, 14, For God shall bring, what does it say? Every work into judgment. With every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. You can't hide your life. Now you can confess your sins and allow the blood of Jesus to cleanse your record. Amen. We can turn to Jesus and have his record in the great judgment placed instead of our judgment. Praise God. But you cannot hide the secrets of your life. Because the Bible says eventually every secret, everything done, whether good or evil, will come to light. There is a judgment. And that judgment is happening in heaven. Hebrews 9 verse 27 says, And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the what? The judgment. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 498, says, When the record of heaven shall be open, the judge will not in words declare to man his guilt, but will cast one penetrating, convincing glance, and every deed, 
Every transaction of life will be vividly oppressed, impressed upon the memory of the wrongdoer. His own lips will confess his shame. The sins hidden from the knowledge of men will then be proclaimed to the whole world more than anything that we need to be cognizant of and concerned about is not just the selfie camera on our phones, but that there is a God in heaven who is watching us. That there is a judgment occurring in the sanctuary over our lives right now. How different we would live our lives if we knew that God was there silently watching the things that we are doing, silently listening to the things that we are saying. We as a people, we as followers of Christ have been called to live as if all of heaven were watching. 2,500 years ago, in a royal palace of a king, the same watcher who records your acts was quietly watching and recording the actions of a king by the name of Belshazzar. He also thought that there would be little consequence for the decisions he was making. He thought to himself, I have plenty of time. Little did he realize that very night he was wasting the final opportunity given him by God and would face the judge of the universe as one who had failed the test brought to every man. And you know, this thought came to me just in the last few days. Things can happen quickly, can't they? You know, Wednesday, I was looking forward to, uh, to having a full church service on Sabbath. Wednesday night, in fact, Thursday morning, we were preparing a church service for Sabbath. I, we didn't make the complete decision to uh, live stream this service until Friday. Things can happen so quickly. And you know, people who went to Costco for toilet paper and came home empty-handed, they realize how quickly things can go. We count on a lot of services happening every single day. We count that when we go into our homes and we flip the light switch, that that light is going to come on and the electric company hasn't shut things off overnight. But you know, things can happen very quickly. We count on the grocery store having our carrots, our lettuce, and our bread ready for us when we go. All we have to do is pay that, that swipe that visa, you know, insert that MasterCard chip, and boom, we can walk out with whatever our heart desires. But things can happen very quickly overnight. Belshazzar thought that day was going to be just like any other day. Don't you think? He thought when he woke up, this day is going to be like every other day. But he didn't realize that while events were happening on planet Earth, records were being kept in heaven. And unbeknownst to him, he came to a point where he had gone too far. Who is Belshazzar? Well, Belshazzar was a king who ruled in Babylon after Nebuchadnezzar. For years, critical scholars made the accusation that because Belshazzar was not mentioned in any archaeological finds, the Bible must have made him up. He's a fictional character. This accusation has been leveled against many of the characters of the Bible. But time and time again, an archaeologist will dig up an artifact proving that person a historical figure, and Belshazzar is no, ex no exemption, exception. In 1861, W.H.F. Talbot published the translation of a prayer by Nebuchadnezzar asking his God to bless his son, Belshazzar. That was in 1861. Tablet 38,299 called Nebuchadnezzar Chronicles is in the British Museum and records that Nebuchadnezzar entrusted the rulership of Babylon to his son, Belshazzar. 
This tablet was first translated by Sidney Smith in 1924. This is all in harmony with what the Bible records in Daniel chapter 5. Isn't that wonderful? Praise God. Nebuchadnezzar was perhaps the greatest Babylonian king to have ever reigned. However, the kings that followed Nebuchadnezzar left the kingdom of Babylon in chaos. Nebuchadnezzar's son was evil Marduk, who had been assassinated after two years on the throne by his brother-in-law, who took over the Babylonian throne as king. He lasted only four years on the throne and died. The brother-in-law's son was then appointed as a boy king, but was assassinated by a dissatisfied group. Man, think about if, if somebody asks you to be king. It's not a walk in the park. All right. And Nebuchadnezzar, the father of Belshazzar, was appointed by the dissatisfied group as king. Nebuchadnezzar moved from Babylon to Tima in Arabia to devote himself to the worship of the moon god Sin and transferred the rulership of Babylon to his son Belshazzar. So while Belshazzar's ruling in Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, his father, has gone to Tema to devote his life to the worship of this moon god. Ironically, the moon god's name is Sin. He's devoted his life to Sin and given the kingdom to his son. Well, the city of Babylon actually hated Belshazzar. Uh, well, actually hated Belshazzar's father, Nebuchadnezzar, because he would not honor the Babylonian god, but instead worshipped the Arabian moon god. To make matters worse... Cyrus, who was the nephew of King Darius of the Medo-Persian Empire, had led an army to capture all the cities of Babylon except for the capital, which was Babylon. And now he was at the very gates of Babylon besieging the city, the greatest city in the ancient world. The very night of this story, according to archaeologists, was October 12, 539 B.C. Babylon had crumbled apart from a mighty empire down to a single fortified city, the capital of Babylon. Now it was surrounded by the Medo-Persian army. Inside the city, Belshazzar, feeling secure behind man-made walls, was throwing a feast for a thousand of his lords of Babylon. One thousand of his lords. Penthouse party... At Belshazzar's palace. And we find the story in Daniel chapter 5. And I invite you, wherever you are, to turn to Daniel chapter 5. And we're going to read this story together. Daniel 5, starting in verse 1. Daniel chapter 5, starting in verse 1. And this is what it says. Belshazzar, the king, made a great feast for how many of his lords? A thousand of his lords and drank wine in the presence of the thousand while he tasted. Now, was this just grape juice? Oh, no. This is the sort of wine that Proverbs says bites like a serpent. This is not the wine that Jesus had on the, uh, when he changed the, the water to wine there in the, uh, um, the wedding feast. Oh, no. Jesus would never give this sort of wine that would confuse the mind and turn hearts from the Lord. That's not the wine that Jesus gives. The wine that Jesus gives is fresh from the vine and pure. And by the way, since we're on the topic, have you heard that you should drink a little wine because it's good for your health? Have you heard that before? Drink a little wine. I used to have a guy. He said, I drink one cup of wine before bed because it's good for my health. And people will say, well, Paul told Timothy to drink a little wine for his stomach. Scientists today have discovered what it is in wine that is good for your health. And it's not the alcohol. It's something called resveratrol. 
and resveratrol is just as much present and is better for you in grape juice that is unfermented than it is in fermented wine. You can get all the benefits of wine and more by drinking grape juice. And you can get the benefits plus all of the issues if you want to drink the fermented wine. Now, does Jesus, when Jesus gives you something, does he give you the good and the bad together, or is that Satan? That is Satan. Satan always gives us a little bit of good mixed with the bad. That's why the tree that he was in in the Garden of Eden is called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He mixes it together. He blends the good and the evil together. But when Jesus gives us, he gives us only what is good. And so when Jesus made the wine there in the, in the marriage feast, it was only good. But the wine that Belshazzar was drinking, this wasn't good wine. This wasn't wine that Jesus would give. This was wine that Satan would give. And it confused the minds and caused, caused the revelers to sink deeper and deeper and deeper in their moral debauchery. So the verse continues. While he tasted the wine, Belshazzar gave the command to bring the gold and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple, which had been in Jerusalem, that the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. He did this while under the influence of wine. You know, there are many things that may seem smart when we're not in our right mind. This was the line that, Nebe that Belshazzar crossed. Verse 3, Then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken from the temple of the house of God, which had been in Jerusalem. And the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines, drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze and iron, wood and stone. Doesn't it seem strange that Belshazzar throws a party when right outside his walls is the Medo-Persian army? I mean, this is the utter symbol of arrogance. <laughs> Medo-Persian army. They've taken every city of mine, but they won't take this one. I mean, talk about presumption. Throwing a party when your enemy is besieging your city. Why would Belshazzar throw a party when he was on the verge of losing everything? When your world is crumbling apart, there is one of two ways that everyone responds. Either you respond with humility or with pride. You can respond with humility, which is, as your world is falling apart, you recognize your weaknesses, you repent of your sins, you fall on the arms of divine grace and recognize God is the one who rules above. Or you can uh, respond with pride. You say, I'm strong enough, smart enough, crafty enough to pull myself out of this mess alone. You may shake your fist at heaven or you may simply ignore the God that, that God is even there. But whatever your attitude, pride says, I don't need help because pride always makes a savior and God out of self. Belshazzar chose the second option in, the, in this emergency. He trusted the walls of the city rather than the protection of God. He trusted the storage of food and the fresh, constant supply of water from the Euphrates, which ran under the walls through the middle of the city, rather than recognize God as his provider. He trusted worldly advisors and his own kingly position, rather than calling on God's wisdom and recognizing one who rules over kings. In choosing to put his trust in man, Belshazzar was gathering to himself a curse. Jeremiah 17, verses 5 through 9, says, Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. And you know, friends, we're facing an emergency. 
In fact, the President of the United States called it a national emergency. The governor, the mayor have all said in Portland, Oregon, it's an emergency. When you face an emergency, where do you turn? What is your first response? Do you trust in the walls that surround you rather than God to surround you? Do you trust in your pantry above your divine provider? There will come a day when all the food that we have stored will do us no good, for we will leave it behind as we flee to the mountains. Learning now when we face emergencies to trust in the hand of God is so essential because Jesus said that there is coming a time of trouble which has not come upon earth before. Now God is preparing us to face that time of trouble, not resting upon the hands of man, not relying upon the hands of flesh, not relying upon our pocketbooks, but relying upon God, saying, Lord, here I am. Lead me and guide me. Feed me and provide for me. Show me what you want me to do. My life is in your hands. You know, I think had Belshazzar fallen on his knees, confessed his sins, and said, God of Daniel, God of Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, I have sinned. Rather than throwing a party, if he had put, put on sackcloth and ashes and mourned like the people of Nineveh, God surely would have had mercy on Babylon like he had had mercy on the town of Nineveh. But instead of humility, pride. Instead of confession, there was arrogance. You see, it wasn't that Belshazzar was unaware of his need to call on God. God's work in the life of the greatest Babylonian king of the past was clear to Belshazzar. Belshazzar knew the story of his grandfather Nebuchadnezzar. He had heard how the king had been humbled by God because of his pride and self-glorification. You know, I mean, just read it for yourself in Daniel 4. Daniel 4, verse 28. This is Belshazzar's grandfather. The story of Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel 4, verse 28, says, All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, he was walking about the royal palace of Babylon. The king spoke, saying, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? While the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you, and they shall drive you from men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make you eat grass like oxen, and seven times shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he desires. Belshazzar knew. He knew that his predecessor, his grandfather, had lost the kingdom for seven years because of his pride. And he was like a common, common cattle grazing there in the fields. He knew. He also knew that God had restored the kingdom to his grandfather when his grandfather had finished those seven years and had given glory to God and repented in humiliation. He knew. The story in Daniel continues with King Nebuchadnezzar literally losing his mind. Proverbs 16 verse 18 says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a, before a fall. It wasn't because he was unaware of where his steps would eventually lead. Belshazzar had the clear example of the greatest king of Babylon to follow. If he wanted to learn, the lessons from God were there. God himself was willing to teach and also to bless Belshazzar because the promises of God are open to anyone who is willing to put their trust in him. When God says something like, pride goes before a fall, or cursed is the man who trusts in man, 
That doesn't just apply to people who lived long ago. These are universal rules that apply to all people. They apply to you today. And they applied to Belshazzar in Babylon, just as they did to Nebuchadnezzar. But Belshazzar was blinded by pleasure and pride. Prophets and Kings, page 522, says, Belshazzar had known of his grandfather's banishment by the decree of God from society of men. And, she goes on and says, he was familiar with Nebuchadnezzar's conversion and miraculous restoration. But Belshazzar allowed the love of pleasure and self-gratification to efface the lessons that he should never have forgotten. He wasted the opportunities graciously granted him and neglected to use the means within his reach to becoming more fully acquainted with truth. That which Nebuchadnezzar had finally gained at the cost of untold suffering and humiliation, Belshazzar passed by with indifference. You know, some opportunities pass by and we will never be given them again. Some lessons are given, and if we neglect to learn them now, our crippled way of handling life will be permanently stamped upon our characters. The delusion so often accepted by the multitude is that I have time. I'll do it later. It's too difficult now. How often those are the uh, phrases that I've used in my own life. Have you ever used those phrases in your life? It's too difficult now. I'll do it later. I have time. Prophets and Kings, page 536 says, The history of nations speaks to us today. To every nation and to every individual, God has assigned a place in His great plan. Today, men and nations are being tested by the plummet in the hand of Him who makes no mistake. All are by their own choices deciding their destiny and God is overruling all for the accomplishment of his purposes. So you see, the story of Belshazzar and Nebuchadnezzar is really the story of your life and my life. The curtain that veils the unseen world is pulled back and God is giving us the privilege of seeing our own lives through the life of a king lived 2,500 years ago and we have the opportunity today to not make the same mistake that he made and his grandfather made as we face peril in our lives today. When life is crumbling apart, and we know that God is calling us to something higher, something better, something eternal, look at Nebuchadnezzar. Let your eyes consider Belshazzar and determine to humble yourself before the hand of the Almighty God now, today, right now, before the handwriting appears on the wall. And the wasted opportunity is written forever in the chronicles of heaven, and the words are pronounced. He has been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Great Controversy, page 491 says, While the man of business is absorbed in the pursuit of gain, while the pleasure lover is seeking indulgence, while the daughter of fashion is arranging her adornments, it may be in that hour the judge of all the earth will pronounce the sentence, Thou art weighed in the balances and found wanting. And this is why Jesus said, Take heed. Watch. Pray, for you do not know when the time is. The message to Sardis, you remember this, the seven churches? The message, you know what the message to Sardis is? Revelation chapter 3, verse 3, it says, Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. I imagine myself driving to Costco thinking that there will be toilet paper. I imagine myself driving my family out to Baja Fresh or another restaurant thinking to myself it's just another day when sudden destruction comes. Life can change so quickly, friends. 
And this is why Jesus tells us that we need to watch and pray. Be ready. Watch and pray. Be ready. Be ready for the things that are coming upon you. Turn to the Lord. Make a habit, a holy habit of trusting in the Lord. Belshazzar was not watching, watching, nor fasting, nor praying. But in the time of his greatest need, he threw a party. Blinded his own mind through pride and pleasure to the realities of what God has brought before him. Not realizing that there was an invisible witness standing in the midst of that party. Prophets and Kings, page 524, says, Little did Belshazzar think that there was a heavenly witness to his idolatrous revelry, that a divine watcher, unrecognized, looked upon the scene of profanation, heard the sacrilegious mirth, beheld the idolatry. At long last, Belshazzar filled the cup of iniquity full, and the decree from the King of Kings and Lord of Lords came to the unseen watcher, right, Mine, mine, tekel, ufarse. We're in Daniel chapter 5, verses 8 through 9. Now all the king's wise men came, but they could not read the writing or make known to the king its interpretation. Then King Belshazzar was greatly troubled. His countenance was changed and his lords were astonished. Or perplexed. Sometimes we read this story and inside there might be a shout of triumph because the bad guy is getting what he deserves. But before we allow our hearts to shout, step back and realize that in the eyes of God, Belshazzar was a soul he longed to save. And Babylon, a kingdom he longed to heal. The finger of God did not pronounce judgment upon a man and a nation out of delight, but with great sorrow. I wonder if there are individuals in our mind who if the judgments of God fell on them, we would feel a sense of righteous indignation. because they've been pursuing a wrong course for such a long period of time, rather than sorrow. Sorrow for these individuals. Jeremiah 51, verses 8 through 9. Um, I'd like you to turn there with me in your Bibles. Uh, If you have your Bibles at home... um, you're watching on your computer, turn over to Jeremiah 51, verses 8 through 9. It's important for you to listen to what God says about Babylon. Jeremiah 51, verses 8 through 9. By the way, if there are some who are listening online and you want to open up a new tab in your browser, a good Bible website to search and study the Bible is Blue Letter Bible. Dot com, blueletterbible.com or BLB, Blue Letter Bible. So we're in Jeremiah 51, verses 8 through 9, and listen to what it says. It says, Babylon has suddenly fallen and been destroyed. And then what does it say? Wail for her. Take balm for her pain. Perhaps she may be what? Did God love Babylon? Perhaps she may be healed. We would have healed Babylon, says the Lord, but she is not healed. Forsake her and let us go, everyone, to his own country, for her judgment reaches to heaven and is lifted up to the skies. God does not delight in the destruction of any person. No matter how long they've been walking away from him, God's desire is always to heal and restore because the children of Satan, God had originally created to be the children of God. God wants those individuals saved. Oh, friends, when you see pastors 
or people in positions of authority walking contrary to the will of God rather than criticize, it is much better that we pray. Pray for them. Pray for their souls. Pray that God would open the light to them. Pray for those who are uh, walking in crooked paths. Pray for them because the Lord desires to heal, not break apart. He desires to restore, not cast away. God's heart goes out for these individuals and God's, God wants your heart and my heart to be with his heart. God longs to save and show mercy. His love cries out after his lost and wayward children. Like a father watching his son waste away his life, the Father in heaven cries out after the lost. Ezekiel 33 verse 11 says, Say to them, as I live, says the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The Lord longs to save, longs to heal, longs to restore and redeem and gather again to Himself His children. But in every life there is a line that once crossed forever, forever fixes the destiny. There is a door, friends, that will someday close and neglected opportunity will vanish forever. The sand in the hourglass of heaven will eventually run out and on that day, the Lord of heaven will say once more, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Then on that awful day, the door of mercy, of grace, of patience and long-suffering the door of opportunity held open for so long will finally close. The latch will click and an angel of heaven will arise. And then will be declared what is written in Revelation 22, 11. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy... Let him be holy still. As Belshazzar and all the mighty men and women of Babylon looked upon the hand as it wrote on the wall, fear and guilt rose up before them. The same fear and guilt that will occupy the hearts of those who stand before the judgment of God as their life flashes before their eyes at the end of the thousand years. Oh, my friends, I pray none here will experience that. What an awful day it will be. It is the fear that realizes that what has been done can now never be undone. The awful realization. The Bible actually says that the king's knees began to shake so much that they knocked together. The king called for the wise men to interpret the message, but they couldn't. At long last, it was suggested that Daniel, the prophet of God, be called before the king to read and interpret the message. And this is what Daniel said. Daniel 5, verse 22. Daniel 5, 22. But you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, although you knew all this. You have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven. They have brought the vessels of his house before you. And you and your lords, your wives and your concubines have drunk wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold and bronze and iron and wood and stone, which do not see or hear or know. And the God who holds your breath in his hand and owns all your ways, you have not glorified. Then the fingers of the hand were sent from him, and this writing was written. And this is the inscription that was written. Mine, mine, tekel, ufarsin. This is the interpretation of each word. Mine. God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tekel. You have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez. Your kingdom has been given, divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. 
The word mine is a variation of the name for a particular coin called a mina. One mina was worth 60 shekels. Tekel is a variation of the name for a particular coin called a shekel. So you have the shekel. And then Ufarsin was also a weight that equaled half a shekel. The phrase mine, mine, tekel, ufarsin was a riddle that could have gone something like this. Dollar, dollar, a dime, and a nickel. What it means according to Daniel is first mine. God has numbered your kingdom. God had a bar or a standard that he desired to see the kingdom of Babylon rise to. This standard was the test for not only Babylon, but for every king and kingdom, and is the test for every human being. Will the kingdom, will the king, will we submit to fill the place that God has designed us to fill in this life? Those who faithfully fill the place that God has assigned for them will pass the test and retain the glory which God has given. But those who neglect to fill the place God has assigned for them in life will see their glory fade as every other kingdom and king has experienced. Prophets and Kings, page 535, says, Every nation that has come upon the stage of action has been permitted to occupy its place on earth that the fact might be determined whether it would fulfill the purpose of the Watcher and the Holy One. Prophecy has traced the rise and progress of the world's great empires, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. With each of these, as with the nations of less power, history has repeated itself. Each has had its period of test. Each has failed. Its glory faded. Its power departed. So mine means God has placed, has a place for you to fill in your life. Tekel. Daniel interpreted it as you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Since a shekel was one sixtieth of a mina... To put them in a scale, you would easily see that the shekel is not even half as equal to the mina. God has placed for you, has a place for you to fill, my friends, but in choosing your own path, you choose a direction that God cannot glorify, cannot glorify God or reach even half the potential to which God has called. At the end of life, our choices will be weighed in the balances of what God could have done in you and through you had you made a full surrender to Him. Prophets and Kings, page 524, says, Belshazzar had impiously lifted in himself up against the God of heaven and had trusted in his own might, not supposing that any would dare say, Why dost thou thus? But now he realized that he must render an account of the stewardship entrusted to him and that for his wasted opportunities and his defiant attitude, he could offer no excuse. Finally, we come to Upharsin which is the plural form of Perez. Daniel interpreted it as, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Those who do not fill the position God has for them in this life will watch their glory and success fade until opportunity has passed and another is given the test which God had at one time given to you. Once the handwriting is on the wall, it's too late. This is from the Bible Echo, September 17, 1894. In the history of Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar, God speaks to the people today. The condemnation that will fall upon the inhabitants of the earth in this day will be because of their rejection of light. Our condemnation in the judgment will not result from the fact that we have lived in error. Our judgment will not be from the fact that we have what? Lived in error. But from the fact that we have neglected heaven sent opportunities for discovering truth. There's someone always watching. Always watching. 
And he's watching because he believes that through his power you can rise to the place that he is calling you to rise. There's only one friends, one thing, friends, that can keep us from accomplishing what God has called us to accomplish. And that is when we choose to no longer put our faith in him, but trust in the arm of flesh rather than to trust in the arms of the Lord. Will you choose today to place your faith, your trust, your life in his hands as we face uh, some of the things that we're facing with the coronavirus? Will you choose to fill faithfully the positions and duties that God has given you to fill today? They may not be great and grand positions, but nonetheless, God can be glorified in you doing your best in the place that He has placed you. Will you give your life to Him today? I'd like to uh, ask you to join me in prayer as we give our life to the Lord and uh, commit our ways to Him. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank You for the story of Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar. We thank You, Lord, that You have a plan for each one of us. We thank You, God, that no matter how far we've fallen or how long we've walked away from You, that there is still a God in heaven whose hand of mercy reaches out and says, come home, come home. And I pray, Lord, that your mercy would continue to be extended to each one who is listening from home or is listening here. I pray, Lord, that, that you would give us strength to commit our way and our life to you, to place all our trust in you, to not trust in Costco or Walmart to provide for our needs, but to trust in you fully, Lord, to trust in you. May you be our provider, our sustainer, our constant friend during these times. And I ask, Lord, and believe that through, through your power and your glorious might, we will be able to walk in the path that you have set out for us to walk in this life and fill the position that you've given us to fill in this life. May we fill it gratefully and faithfully. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. closing hymn, let us stand together as we sing number 350, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. Father, I just pray that you would bless each one of us as we go from this place. May your face shine upon us and may your glory 
uh, be brought to you through our lives in your name. Amen. Amen. We want to thank you for tuning in to our live stream, and we want to thank those who participated in the service here um, on Sabbath. Please stay tuned through our Friday newsletter. Our board will be meeting to discuss the coronavirus and its impact upon um, Portland Church and what we can do to combat that. You know, one of the reports that I read showed that the coronavirus, if, uh, if we do nothing, the spread rapidly increases to a climax point, which is higher than our current United States medical system can handle, which means that there are not enough respirators and other things to treat those who are seriously affected by the coronavirus if we do nothing. If we practice social distancing for a period of time, that bell curve is uh, deeply recessed. It's leveled out so that um, when people do get sick, there are respirators that are available. There are other things that are available in the hospital system. So uh, us practicing this live stream for the time being can save people's lives. And so I hope that you understand. Continue to remain faithful, friends, wherever you are, in your homes, around the world. Remain faithful. We may not be gathered together in large companies, but angels are with you wherever you're gathering. Stay close to Jesus. And until we meet again, God bless and happy Sabbath. Stay tuned. We'll send out an email this week with further announcements. God bless and take care.